has just told me to go right ahead. So, so I'm going to do just that. Uh, uh, welcome uh, to this very uh, provocative and interesting and a, dis and a topic that is, you know, beating very loudly in each of our hearts, uh, democracy in general and whether the liberal democracy uh, is in a free fall. Uh, I think in home after home, in drawing room after drawing room, in office after office, this is the dominant discussion, uh, be it uh, India in terms of what's happening around us at various levels or globally in, in terms of the changing world order and looking at the, how various countries are behaving uh, politically and how the new regimes are uh, coming up. Uh, there is clear, there, on, on one side we feel as though the, the liberal order is being uh, squelched, it is being smashed uh, and, and there is a whole lot of disruption happening uh, led by several strong men uh, in Russia, in the US, in Turkey, uh, in China, of course. And on the other, that perhaps these are, uh, there are greater voices that are finally finding an expression uh, through new media, through social media, uh, generally, uh, and a, a change in the way voter behavior is changing, what countries are, what their leaders are telling them to do. Um, <clears throat> from Africa to Europe, Basically, I think uh, the discussion is around the Western democratic model versus new emerging models uh, that have been there in, in, in various countries across time. Um, we are very lucky to have with us uh, Dr. Larry Diamond. He's a rock star of democracy and I think among the top scholars uh, uh, in the world uh, that has explored this field. Uh, cut it, sniped it, and just gone into it. He is Mr. Democracy, uh, for lack of a better word. And we are privileged to have you here with us, sir. And uh, so the, 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 the next few minutes or next couple of hours are going to be in the following way. He's going to uh, give us a small presentation. Uh, he says it will be half an hour and I'll try to uh, be the autocrat here and cut him down because I can already see there is so much discussion and anxiety in your eyes uh, uh, surging to ask questions. Uh, after the presentation, uh, we'll have a small chat, then we'll open it out. I'll try to get as many people as possible into the question uh, and answer. And uh, so, once again, welcome everybody and over to you, Larry. Okay. Thank you, uh, Gautam. It's uh, really an honor to be here at the Observer Research Foundation. We really <clears throat> appreciate the opportunity to partner with you. Uh, I have here a version of a presentation I've been giving for a while. It keeps getting darker every year, uh, and I apologize for that, but I'm just tracking the trends. I changed the title a little. I, I don't think the liberal democratic order is in free fall but I fear it could be if we don't uh, acknowledge the scope and depth of the challenges it's facing, which are starting to converge in a lot of ways. So I'll do my best to run through <clears throat> what is typically a much longer lecture very quickly, and I will simply say that uh, the Observer Research Foundation has all these slides. I give you my permission to share them with anybody who, who wants them and wants to study them more. I think there are six uh, challenging trends that have been constituting a deepening democratic recession in the world. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, levels of freedom and democracy have been declining for more than a decade now. I called this uh, a democratic recession. At the time, uh, some people questioned whether it really was since the decline was and even in numerical terms remains somewhat modest. But I think there are alarming developments beneath the simple uh, numerical trends. One of these is uh, the deterioration and I'd say poor state of the rule of law in a lot of uh, countries and regions around the world. And I'll, I'll try to summarize this in a way very briefly. The third, which I think is bringing many people together uh, in rooms like this around the world, with a sense of increasing concern, if not alarm, is the rise uh, and spread of various forms of illiberal populism in the world. I think populism is a very popular and can be a very shallow concept. I'll try and pin it down. 
And then, of course, we have rising polarization and intolerance, which uh, social media is magnifying. It's very important to understand this is happening in an international context, a global context, in which two great authoritarian powers, one kind of resurgent, the other uh, relentlessly ascendant, are imposing, uh, trying to impose their norms and their will on other countries and regions. And then, of course, the West itself is not doing very well. So uh, I don't need to, I think, in this group, define democracy, but I just want to uh, remind ourselves that it's not just the electoral form of democracy with majority rule and popular sovereignty that we think uh, people want and value liberal democracy. Uh, and it is liberal democracies that have resilience. And when the liberal aspects of democracy erode, democracy itself is at greater risk. Uh, I can show this statistically in a variety of ways. Uh, but it's very important to understand that the second and third dimensions of upholding minority rights, a civic culture, the rule of law, and constraint of executive power are extremely important in and of themselves and in order to sustain democracy at all. This is the aggregate statistical trend. If you look at uh, the Freedom House data and kind of gently adjust it for some of their um, unsustainable classifications of countries as democracies that are not, the red line uh, tracks the percentage of states in the world, over one million population, that meet a serious but minimal test of electoral democracy. And as you can see, that started increasing very gradually when the third wave of democracy began in 1974. Then it jumped up with the fall of the East um, uh, European communist states. Uh, and by the early 90s, we had a majority of these larger states in the world that were democracies. This percentage peaked at 57% of states over 1 million population in 2006. And since then, it's been in a recession. That's the single uh, uh, you know, most important indication of a democratic recession. Uh, there are fewer democracies in the world, now only about 51%. And if you uh, impose a more rigorous test uh, of liberal democracy, this being all the states in the world that get a one or a two on political rights and a one or a two on civil liberties, uh, on the annual Freedom House scales of political rights and civil liberties. Uh, this has also gently eroded from about 34% to 31%. Now, the next slide you'll appreciate because it shows how important India is the future of democracy in the world. This is the percentage of states in the, uh, of people in the world who are living in democracies. And God help us if we ever lose India as a democracy, because this slide will show a catastrophic uh, implosion, as you can imagine. But now, again, purely coincidentally, there are also 51% of people in the world living in electoral democracies. A much smaller percentage, 21%, live in liberal democracies. You'll see in this slide, you saw in the last slide, you'll see in other slides, there's a bit of a, um, uh, uh, a turning point that happens in the year 2006. This is when the expansion of democracy and freedom in the world end and the democratic recession begins, and there are a number Just of reasons why. What's this tower in the middle in the 77 to uh, 80? Uh, that blip, uh, which you are very astute to notice, uh, there's only one country that's big enough in the world to account for that blip, and what you is, know what it is. India's emergency. Yeah. Well, no, this is the opposite of that. This is after the emergency. So the drop in the red line in 75 to 76 is the Indian emergency. The upsurge immediately after it was Freedom House classifying India as a liberal democracy the following year. But then the scores declined again. And it's India's been 
a two on political rights and a three on civil liberties uh, in the Freedom House judgment for a very, very long time. Uh, this is the percentage of states, the red bars that are electoral democracies, and the percentage in each region, the blue bars that are liberal democracy. And you can see in the West, Western Europe in the United States, um, mostly they're liberal, almost all liberal democracies. In Eastern Europe, only about 59% are liberal democracies, about 80% are democracies. I'm very worried about Central and Eastern Europe. I think there's a serious backward trend there. Two in five of the uh, 25 states in Asia are democracies. Actually, if we do this next year, it'll be 11 rather than 10, because I think we'll count Malaysia in that category. Uh, but this is a year-end number. And you know, for people who say democracy isn't possible in poor countries, uh, well, of course, you know that has, has not been a generalization that is consistent with India's experience. And we see that a third of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa meet the test of electoral democracy, and, and some of them are more or less liberal. Now, this is a very famous slide that comes uh, from essentially Freedom House. It's the ratio of countries that are uh, improving their freedom score every year on that scale. It's actually Freedom House has a 100-point scale of um, political rights and civil liberties that stands behind the two seven-point scales uh, against the uh, percentage or the number of countries that are declining in political rights or civil liberties or both. And you can see that from the end of the Cold War in 1991, the far left bar, through 2005, in most of these years, many more countries were gaining in freedom than were declining. Usually the rate was about one and a half to one, sometimes two to one or more. In 2006, this favorable balance ends. And beginning in 2007, in every year for 11 consecutive years, uh, only about half or a little more as many countries improved in freedom as the ones that declined. So again, we see this inflection point around 2006, 2007, where the expansion of democracy and freedom in the world halts and a global political recession begins to form. And basically, this has been a global phenomenon in two senses. First of all, it's now, there are signs of political recession everywhere in the world. And second of all, it's happening to all forms of regimes. Liberal democracies are becoming less liberal, including the United States and I think parts of Western Europe. Electoral democracies in many cases are not performing well and are at risk of crisis or failure. You see what's been going on with the Philippines under Duterte. I could talk about Peru. Brazil's having a huge crisis over uh, corruption. And you know we've lost democracy in Hungary and Turkey and Thailand and Bangladesh and Zambia and in many other uh, emerging uh, democracies. And then what we call the competitive authoritarian regimes, they weren't democratic but at least there was significant opposition and some space for civil society. They're now saying, frankly, what the heck? Uh, no one cares, so we'll just rule as nastily as we want to. And Hun Sen has completely crushed the opposition party, all forms of dissent, pluralism, uh, opposition of any kind. And then you've got the unapologetic authoritarian regimes that are um, repressing opposition, and in the case of China, creating an Orwellian surveillance state ever more uh, aggressively and comprehensively. The result of this is that more and more democracies are breaking down. The democratic failure rate during this third wave of global democratization was about one in six uh, during the first decade, 1975 to 84. Then in the subsequent two decades, it fell to 10% or less. And in the last decade, it's back up to about one in six, 16.2%. And if you count all the democracies uh, 
that have existed during this period in some countries like Thailand two or three times, uh, a third of all the democracies that have existed in this 42 year period have failed. So that's a very sobering you know, general statistic for us to bear in mind. Uh, I am arguing the obvious that the vehicle for this demise is increasingly not a military coup or even a one-stop uh, executive coup uh, of the kind that Alberto Fujimori uh, imposed on uh, Peru in the early 1990s when he shut down the Congress, suspended the Constitution, arrested hordes of people and said, I'm now in charge alone because the country's in crisis. This is a process of executive strangulation of democracy that happens much more incrementally and involves a playbook, uh, a script, a 12-step program that you can see here. And it can start very early on by just uh, the elected, democratically elected executive beginning to demonize and crucially, in terms of what it means for the future, delegitimize political opposition. And then he, it's almost always a he, starts undermining the independence of the courts. You can see what Duterte is doing in the Philippines now, what Orban and the Law and Justice uh, Party have done in Hungary and Poland, and <clears throat> so on and so forth. They go after the media. Uh, they go after internet freedom. They start uh, putting the noose on civil society haranguing the business community, and you know you can see all these steps. Uh, and it's just a noose that keeps tightening uh, tighter and tighter on more and more aspects of democratic pluralism until, as in Turkey, there's really nothing left that can stand in the way of an increasingly ruthless autocrat like Erdogan. So when I ask, when any of us ask, why is this happening? Well, we can go back if you want to ask me to why 2006 was such a crucial year of inflection point. But I think the general causes are uh, longstanding familiar ones. Uh, I said, and now I repeat, uh, that democracy is vulnerable when it isn't rooted in a liberal order of a strong rule of law and strong constraints on executive power. When you don't have that, you have A, a lower quality democracy, but B, a democracy that is more liable to outright failure. So you have those first two elements. And then the third element you can track uh, and find a powerful correlation between the rise in political polarization, between contending parties, contending ethnic groups, uh, between different religious or other identity lines, and um, the uh, increasing dysfunction and paralysis in the political process, uh, in the parliament, in the norms and so on, that uh, result from this intense level of polarization. Typically, this happens in the context of and may further erode uh, weak political institutions such as parties and parliament itself. Economic performance tends to be very poor, but it isn't always a matter of uh, poor aggregate economic growth. Sometimes democracies fail or are gradually strangled in the midst of pretty decent economic growth, but the benefits are not justly dis uh, distributed, and you've got a gathering phenomenon of bad governance that's eventually going to doom this as well, as we're seeing now in Turkey with public deficits rising and corruption really predictably beginning to unravel Erdogan's so-called economic miracle. The result of, of all of this is people lose trust in democratic institutions, uh, democracy loses legitimacy, and then you have all of this happening in a dynamic and rapidly evolving international context in which Chinese ambition is uh, an interventionism around the world in a variety of ways uh, that need, I think, much closer scrutiny is rising. Russia is beginning to uh, be much more aggressive, literally in the old fashioned ways on its borders and beyond, but also in terms of intervention in and manipulation of uh, 
democratic politics in other countries, including the United States. And then you've got this phenomenon of kleptocracy and uh, massive amounts of stolen money sloshing across uh, borders into the financial systems and property markets of the West and so on. And it's really a toxic mix. I said that rule of law is a part of the problem. I just want to show you that you can take these two, and I think it's fruitful to take these two Freedom House scales of political rights and civil liberties and reconfigure uh, them into three scales of political rights, civil liberties, and transparency in the rule of law. And you simply take out the measures having to do with judicial independence, control of corruption, transparency, and so on, and create a third scale. So I did this with these measures uh, and the data that Freedom House has provided from 2005 to 2017 and just scaled it zero to one. What you find in almost every region is two things. Number one, it is always transparency and the rule of law that is performing the worst. And number two, in most regions, uh, if there's change in these scales, it's transparency and the rule of law that's declining the most. And that's what you see with the green trend line, uh, which is the lowest trend line behind me in Africa. Civil liberties are doing the best, then political rights and rule of law is well behind. This is the average for Asia, the 25 countries of uh, East, Southeast, and South Asia. And here you see uh, rule of law hasn't changed much, but it's well below political rights and civil liberties. The third phenomenon I mentioned to you is the rise of illiberal populism. And I want to stress that it has these seven dimensions that are very, very dangerous to democracy. First of all, it's very anti-elitist, even though it often is led by very elite people, uh, like uh, the one uh, who's leading the United States. And um, it rails against all the political and technocratic uh, elites of the country. Second of all, and crucially, part of what makes it so dangerous to democracy is that, and what makes it literally a liberal is that it's anti-pluralist. It really disparages al alternatives in civil society, in politics, in the media, and so on, as illegitimate and not, you know, not loyal to the country, not loyal to the people. And that if you don't agree with the populist leader and party, then you're really not uh, a legitimate player in the democracy. It's anti-institutionalist, including important institutions that are necessary to restrain authoritarian populism, like the judiciary, the career prosecutors, uh, the media, and so on. Fourth, it has hegemonic tendencies. The logical uh, extrapolation of anti-pluralism is that you think your party, your point of view, is the only legitimate one, so those others must not really be representing the true people. The fifth element is a very visible plebiscitary uh, character to this brand of democratic politics, if it remains even democratic, which is a preference for direct over representative democracy, and in particular, a direct relationship between the populist leader and the masses, often cultivated through social media, so that all the filters of media editing professionalism and representative democracy fall away. Sixth, it's illiberal. It's quite intolerant of religious and ethnic pluralism. And seventh, it kind of trends toward hyper-nationalism. And we're seeing this in all sorts of places around the world now. And this, I think, is the formula for the rise of this brand of politics in Hungary and Poland in Turkey, and we see various combinations of this elsewhere. I just show you four, uh, you know, I think, examples of this kind of leadership. One, fortunately, is gone, Jacob Zuma in South Africa. Another, Keiko Fujimori, fortunately, is now on the ropes in Peru. Duterte, on the other hand, is mobilizing more and more power, and Orban is, is probably the most powerful leader in Central and Eastern Europe now. The fourth element is social media and what it's doing to intensify uh, 
political polarization by eliminating a common media space, um, destroying the common public sphere so that we're all sliced up into different echo chambers of reinforcing public opinion. And then the logic of social media, as you know, what makes Facebook and Twitter and other of these platforms so profitable is that it's outrageous and extreme posts that lock in people's attention uh, and make them captive to all these ads that come up and bring in more ad revenue for these uh, platforms. So, you know, it's in their interest to have a, a lot of outrageous commentary and, frankly, polarizing content on their platforms because they get more ad revenue from that. And so this empowers the extremes and produces uh, intolerance. The fifth element is the authoritarian power surge. I think who, you know who all these characters are. This involves what's happening inside these countries in terms of the crackdown on civil society. The intensification, as I said, of already very repressive regimes in Russia, China, Egypt, again under the military now the criminalization of foreign flows of money, uh, of transparent democratic support to NGOs in countries like Russia and Egypt, um, the cooperation among authoritarian actors in new organizations like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Gulf Cooperation Council, and the increasing way in which Russia and China in particular are projecting a form of power that is really not soft in the sense of appealing positively to values, but rather as uh, Chris Walker and others at the National Endowment for Democracy have argued in a very important report that I recommend on sharp power. It's sharp. It's really trying to cut into the tissues of these democracies and cynically uh, manipulate and undermine them. So this is basically it. I think you know what happened to uh, American democracy in 2016 with Russia's intervention. And it's now we've got hard evidence that the Russians are doing it again. No surprise. Um, we need, I think, democracies around the world to have a very, very sober and searching view, yeah, I'm almost done, of um, what China's doing to undermine democracy around the world uh, with the expansion of its state-run media, the surreptitious and non-transparent funding of Confucius Institutes and universities around the world, including mine, its purchase of um, U.S. movie studios and information platforms. I found out recently from a leading congressional staffer that a Chinese company bought last year uh, the largest gay online dating site in the world. And this might sound like a fairly innocent thing, but apparently gays around the world are using this dating site to hook up. And some of them are married, and some of them don't particularly want their gay dating behavior you know, made public. And if you now have the Chinese Communist Party holding all this data on people's dating behavior, you know, what does this do for individual rights and possibilities for uh, bribery and um, intimidation around the world. This is the kind of thing that's going on. China funding Western think tanks, various kinds of opaque grants, and lots and lots of monitoring and pressure on overseas Chinese communities, media, and so on. I'm going to leave with you, Gao Tom, a copy of a set of articles we published in the April 2014 Journal of Democracy on China's influence operations abroad. 2018. Uh, yeah, 2018. Thank you. Uh, April. 2018. And then we've got, you know, the more muscular efforts to buy up farmland, technology firms, and so on, forced technology transfer, a uh, phenomenal increase in military spending, the militarization of the South China Seas, uh, is, is sea, uh, and the creation of all these islands. And finally, in this part of the world, I think I only need to mention the name Ham Ban Tota. And you know what I'm talking about. And you, I hope, sense the very great danger that this and other developments like this represent to the free flow of goods and um, sovereignty in the, in the Indian Ocean.
So the final element is the decay of Western democracy. The big red line is what's happened to the United States Freedom House score between 2005 and 2017. You can see it's gone down quite significantly, and it didn't just start happening in 2016. Support for democracy has eroded at least somewhat in recent years. If you now take a rigorous test of support for democracy in the US, a combination of measures, only about 58% of Americans you know, answer consistently in the democratic way. Uh, there are a lot of things that are accounting for this, economic stagnation and decline in the West. We could go on about this growing economic inequality, high levels of immigration and the challenge of managing them, the social media polarization that I've talked about. But finally, uh, there are a lot of global things that are happening that I think are driving the crisis. The intensification of globalization, and societies are really not managing it very well. They're not very ready for it. A lot of the losers from globalization are striking back now and voting for populist alternatives, and they accounted for the Brexit victory as well. Then you have the globalization of corruption and corrupt flows of ill-gotten money through kleptocracy, uh, the rise, I'll repeat, of Russia and China, and the fact that there is some sentiment in the United States, though I think there's fortunately a lot of pushback for this, uh, that's saying, well, maybe the US has just shouldered too many burdens and should now withdraw from the world. Um, hopefully we'll move in the other direction and be able to partner with a lot of other democracies in the world, like India, to try and encourage and support uh, a renewal of democratic commitments in the world because one thing about the world, you know, the United States can't do it alone anymore even if it's got very vigorous leadership, unless we've got much more real democratic partnerships, uh, all of these trends, I think, are going to intensify. So thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. Um, the presentation was far more engaging than I had anticipated. And so thank you. It was very enlightening. And some of the questions that I had, you've already answered. So I'm going to move to the next set, which is what I wanted to ask you was that is illiberalism in liberal democracies rising, which you have proved very well. Second question I wanted to ask is, is China creating a new world order and thereby through it uh, supporting authoritarian, is, uh, authoritarian regimes? That too you have answered. So now I'm going to move to some uh, little different sort of questions. You mentioned that Brexit is a fallout of people voting out of it. And if Brexit, I'm just taking one example, but there are other examples as well. If people are using their vote to change government, to change policy, to change the nature of their nations, then why is democracy in danger? It is a democratic process by which they are doing it. They are voting. The vote is free and fair. Uh, what, what's wrong with it? Is it? Could it be that democracy that had been hijacked by the elites uh, is now under greater threat than democracy itself in, the, in, in terms of having alternative voices, not only talking and uh, doing things, but also voting democratically? Well, that's a really uh, good and challenging and necessary question, and a lot of people are debating it. Um, so I'll answer both parts of your question. You can have a vigorous electoral democracy in which the majority of people strike an illiberal and to some extent intolerant stance. Uh, and even violate the, the rights to some extent of minorities, it's still a democracy for the majority of people. Maybe it will pass the test of electoral democracy in general. But we know from much historical experience that this is sliding down a slippery slope to authoritarianism. Because once you start abandoning liberal commitments to tolerance and the, and the rule of law, there's really no natural stopping point. And this has a natural psychological tendency, but also, I think, a proven historical tendency to simply feed the empowerment of the leader and further erode 
uh, restraining institutions. And there's just a very strong statistical correlation between that and the eventual failure of even electoral democracy. So uh, that's the first point. The reason we should worry is, first of all, I think we should be committed to, on a humanitarian basis, liberal values of tolerance and inclusion in general as a human rights and humanitarian principle. But second of all, those are necessary to sustain all the other liberal dimensions of democracy and ultimately democracy itself. Let me interrupt you here. So then what you are probably suggesting in a sense, and of course I'm stretching your argument very far, is that uh, we should do away with universal suffrage and have only some uh, a group of who are known as educated or who are branded as liberals to be voting in democracies rather than the, the common man on the street who feels differently. Well, uh, of course, you hear a few people uh, suggest that, uh, particularly on a tiny little red dot of a country not far from here. But um, obviously, that is, is not what I believe. And I don't think that is uh, desirable either, because you might get the defense of minority rights, uh, but you get the violation of other forms of civil liberties, of, of most people or all people. And it's very rare that you get an elite, a self-appointed elite, insulating itself from popular sovereignty and governing well and honestly and effectively over a long period of time. Almost always, it leads to abuse of power and popular outrage and frustration. Singapore is a very, very rare example. But I just want to say also that the question you are posing uh, is part of the explanation of why we're having this populist backlash, that there has been a growing gap between elite technocratic <coughs> governing presumptions, philosophies, and impulses, and the growing frustration of the people. And democracy provides a way for adjustment. If you don't get adjustment, you're going to get a revolution at the ballot box, and it may not be very pretty. Now, I think Brexit would have failed without the Russian social media intervention in the British referendum. I think we're seeing growing uh, evidence of that. But even the fact that it got very close is an example of this. Even the fact that Trump got very close, I think he also would have lo lost without the Russian intervention, and that is the conclusion of the former director of uh, national intelligence, uh, James Clapper, in his new book. Uh, but even the fact that he got very close is an indication that a lot of people are deeply frustrated. And I think democracies need to keep you know, navigating between these two tensions of professional, liberal, uh, technocratic, engagement and expertise, judicial and bureaucratic, in the defense of universal norms and principles and good governance, and of the people as the ultimate source of authority and as having the right to chart a new direction. And that's the, the fundamental and unresolvable tension of liberal democracy, is that you need both of those, and there's a constant balance. The final point to be made in response to the tension is that I don't care how pro-immigration you are, and I am deeply pro-immigration. It is pretty obvious that the United States and Western Europe are going to have to lower their levels of immigration for a time being uh, to give themselves just breathing time to adjust to what are nearly, for the United States, nearly historic highs of foreign-born as a, a percentage of the U.S. population and in parts of Europe, Germany, France, Britain, even Sweden, you know, dramatically higher percentages of foreign born among the population than they've ever had in their modern history. So, you know, that is one of the policy consequences. Okay, so uh, my last question, I'll push this even further now. Is democracy, are you looking at democracy and liberal democracy as a religion, uh, which is dogmatic, just because it is supposed to be good, 
for the few or because you are un unwilling to accept the change that is now coming through alternative voices, you call them illiberal even though they have voted through the process, uh, the democratic process, through the, uh, the process of law. Second, it's not necessary that only democracies have done well. Yes, India has done well. It is now no longer done well in the sense it has brought millions out of poverty and uh, hundreds of millions out of poverty and it's now no longer the world's uh, biggest nation that houses the world's largest number of poor. That, that has, India has got out of it and that's a good thing. But China has done even better. So despite the authoritarian regime of China, if the people's welfare is at stake, China has done much better than India or any other country in the world ever at the fastest rate. Wouldn't you think this is uh, an alternative view? Third, in China also I've been speaking to and Russia several scholars there and their, the, the, their thing is, the, the, their argument is that we are not there to change regimes, we are not commenting on your political processes and so on and so forth. Perhaps it is because it is self-serving. Despite that, they are not bothered about political processes of other nations. But when democracies get together and try to bring regime changes towards democracy in other countries through the non-democratic ways of violence, then clearly it becomes more like a religion than a frame of thought or, or a way of life? Well, uh, I don't favor violent interventions to change regimes. Um, and if you want to know why the inflection point started in 2006, a major reason was the US intervention in Iraq, which was the single most powerful event contaminating the term democracy promotion and beginning to associate it more in the minds of a lot of Americans and Europeans and others in the world with uh, the forcible imposition of, a, of at least a putatively democratic model. So uh, I was opposed to that intervention. I went to Iraq after to try and help repair the damage and see what could be done. But um, I think most Amer Americans are strongly opposed to violent or forcible interventions to try and impose democratic change. What they favor and what their flagship organizations like the National Endowment for Democracy do is openly, transparently, peacefully, and in response to requests from civil society and various political actors, provide partnership technical training and some modest uh, support um, to help people achieve their own visions uh, of, um, of democratic change. So I think that what you're saying about China in your last question, that they aren't there to change regimes, well, yeah, they don't overthrow regimes the way Russia has, uh, or haven't intervened in elections the way Russia has in many European countries and in, in the US, and they haven't invaded a neighbor um, for the purpose of altering sovereignty the way Russia's done recently, but they're starting to push the envelope in new ways. And Chinese influence operations in democracies, which are becoming increasingly aggressive uh, and co-optative of political media and organizational actors in Australia, in New Zealand, in Europe, and now in the United States, I think are a new and, and very sobering development. We're crossing a watershed in that sense. Uh, backing up now, just go in reverse order. I think there are two questions you need to ask, two counterfactuals. Number one, could uh, China have done this well without authoritarianism? Keep in mind a few things. Number one, uh, tens of millions of people died under Mao's rule uh, in the famine, which India never had, democratic India, and under forced collectivization and all the other tragedies of tyrannical rule under Mao. You know, ask yourself this question. It is the single most interesting question that could be asked about China. Imagine that the near-death experience 
that Communist Party rule had in Tiananmen Square in 1989 had gone in the other direction and there had been a transition to democracy in China. You know, maybe at first semi-democracy under uh, reformer Zhao Ziyang, something like that. Uh, but then, uh, you know, moving toward the real thing. Who can make the argument that China would not have had, could not have had, as spirited a pace of economic development post-1989 as it's had, had under communist rule? I don't see any logical reason why China couldn't have had 10% growth under an emerging and... Uh, rapidly opening to the world, um, uh, you know, uh, competitive pluralist regime. It would have had a stronger rule of law, for one thing. And I don't see any reason why India can't have 8 to 9% economic growth for a long time now if it can get its leadership together and avoid crippling polarization over um, diversionary issues of identity and so on. Um, so I think that it's a mistake to say that countries can't do quite well economically uh, under democracy. And it, it is just a stark empirical fact that if you look at how different regimes in sub-Saharan Africa have done since the second liberation in 1990, the democracies of sub-Saharan Africa have had manifestly higher economic growth rates than the authoritarian regimes in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, uh, to the first question you posed on this second round about liberal democracy being a religion, it's a really interesting philosophical question. And I would say the following, that I think we're basically talking about the universal values that are in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I'd say, well, uh, there's a religious element to them uh, because those values are derived from a lot of different religions in the world and by no means, by no means, solely Western religions. Uh, and they encompass, I think, universal values that can be found widely across religious traditions, including religious traditions in India and uh, other parts of Asia that uh, affirm restraints on power, human dignity, things like that. So um, there are religious elements to this, uh, but to say that, I mean, when people say is liberal democracy a religion, it implies blind faith. And I don't think it's a blind faith. I think it's, uh, it's rooted in uh, a general norm normative orientation toward human rights. And if you believe in the general shared normative orientation toward human rights as embedded in the Universal Declaration and the International Covenant on uh, Political and Civil Rights, then it's an easy step to make this point. Again, empirically, it's just beyond dispute. Uh, democracies do a far better job of protecting human rights than authoritarian regimes do. Even if you take out the political dimensions, just look at the Freedom House scale of civil liberties. There are no non-democracies at all, not a single one, not, not one, that have one of the three highest scores on the, on the Freedom House scale, seven point scale of civil liberties. Okay, Singapore gets a four. Few other authoritarian states get four. And you get a few democracies that get you know, a four. But generally, there's a very powerful correlation. If you wanna protect human rights, you gotta have democracy. And if you wanna keep democracy uh, and really protect human rights, uh, you need liberal democracy. And I, uh, if you get a majority of the people saying, well, let's tramp all on people's rights, minority rights, and have the kind of democracy we, we want, I'm not going to favor an authoritarian option to stop them, but I'm certainly going to use democratic means to try and make the case for inclusion uh, 
as a better, you know, better normatively and a better long run bet for the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very tempted to answer that question about India and China, but I'll reserve my comments love to hear your uh, until answer. the end. Uh, oh, opening it out. So uh, if you have some questions, uh, just raise your hand. We'll take about two uh, at a time. Yes, ma'am, please. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Nilifar Saharivardi. I'm a journalist. I have two points. Uh, First is, uh, in your opinion, who's going to assure the Palestinians and those people affected by Arab Spring, now Arab winter, democracy? Two, you mentioned a point about techniques like WhatsApp and all having a negative effect regarding polarization. Now, I beg to say this here. If you remember the case of the small uh, school, a, a black boy in America who was labeled as a terrorist, Again, the person, because he got some, I think, trans and he was accused of getting a bomb. But the per later, when that went viral, the news about that, the, in America, the people who came in support of him, the white Americans outnumbered the blacks there. In India, the same thing is happening. Yes, now and then, incidents do take place about minorities being targeted. But the ones who demonstrate against the same, the majorities, they outnumber the minorities. Again, so this is a different kind of polarization possible through techniques like WhatsApp and other electro electronic devices. This is a polarization which I would say WhatsApp and all is not having a negative impact. This is democratic polarization. The, the, there's a positive angle, beat America, beat India. I like it. Commission. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Yes, sir. University of Pennsylvania Institute in India. Uh, just want to ask, uh, does your data show that federal democracies do better in maintaining liberal freedoms than unitary states? Because there's a dispersal of power. Uh, there's a, I mean, decentralization of power and many power centers. So it would be more difficult to undermine uh, democracy or erode democracy in federal systems. I mean, intuitively, I would think that, but what does your data tell you? Yours. So, um, the first question you asked really has, I think, two different questions. One is the rights of the Palestinians to democracy and political sovereignty, and the other is uh, other Arab peoples, right? Uh, you asked who's going to assure those. Well, nobody assures anything in the rather uh, cruel world of geopolitics that we still inhabit. I think it's hard to find, there might be a few contestants, but it's hard to find a greater national tragedy uh, than that that has befallen the Palestinians. Um, you know, they are still without a state. I think that they would be better off, Israel would be better off, and the world would be better off if they had uh, an independent state living at peace with the state of Israel. Uh, that's been the only solution f for uh, peace in the Middle East that you know I could imagine for decades now. But I think the reasons why they don't have one are complicated and are not simply due to political attitudes or trends in Israel or to lack of support internationally. I think the surrounding Arab states and the Palestinians themselves have made a lot of mistakes and have had a lot of intransigence that have made the pursuit of um, a two-state solution more difficult. And now things are moving in an even worse direction. Uh, it's, it's painful to watch. In terms of what you called the Arab winter, um, there's no doubt that that's, that's true. I can tell you who will not assure Arabs of um, the democracy that they overwhelmingly say they want, including in the latest Arab barometer where, once again, about 80% on average of all the Arabs surveyed in different countries say that a democracy with representative elected government 
is the best kind of system. Who will not assure them that? The rulers of these countries. And, you know, the U.S. feels probably it got burned on the last Arab Spring, Libya, Syria, Bahrain, and so on, Yemen now. And so Arabs also say, it's very interesting, overwhelmingly they want democracy. But they also say, by a nearly similar overwhelming margin, at least 70%, I think, that they want political change to be gradual. And I think some of that is the fear of chaos and watching what happened in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, and so on. And in Egypt, where you know things unraveled and then they got a more repressive regime than they'd had under Mubarak. So I think that we have a responsibility in the West. We're still deeply involved to try and press for and support uh, democratic reforms in these countries. But um, you know, revolution is probably not going to achieve very much. Uh, it didn't fully grasp your second question. Uh, I know that you were asking about minorities being targeted and the particular type of danger or, that results from that polarization when the majority religious, ethnic, identity group, whatever it is, vastly outnumbers a targeted minority. I mean, look what's happening in Burma now. It's just horrific to watch where even the elected Democrats, beginning with Aung San Suu Kyi, are in brazen, blatant, horrific denial of the obvious facts of ethnic cleansing going on in a part of the country with, you know, uh, huge amounts, overwhelming amounts of, you know, unimpeachable documentation of what's happening, including visual evidence and public testimony. Uh, and so they're driven to the tortuous explanation that the Rohingya uh, minorities who are being ethnically cleansed are burning down their own homes and villages as a way of cynical manipulation of international opinion. Um, look, I think it is one of the most important features of any good and sustainable democracy that there be some breaks on what the popular majority can do. Um, our founding uh, constitutional framers who were far from perfect and made and agreed to many egregious constitutional abominations, not least slavery. Nevertheless, I think blazed an important trail in recognizing that you couldn't have a democracy worth having if it began and ended without any restraint on popular sovereignty. That is that you would be at risk of tyranny of the majority. And tyranny of the majority can be a temporary majority that's a political majority, or it can be a permanent uh, ethnic, religious, or some other identity majority. But any kind of tyranny is bad. And the fact that a majority support it doesn't, in my mind, make it more morally defensible. So I think we just need to work for, um, you know, for inclusion and tolerance. Now, to Sri's question, um, I haven't done a uh, statistical analysis in this regard. But if you look at the big pluralistic countries in the world, India, Brazil, South Africa to some extent, now you can certainly Nigeria, look at Kenya, US, and so on, you know, you see the following things that I think are um, really beyond dispute. Number one, any really big country needs some degree of federalism to be an effective democracy, because if you try and administer the whole country from the center, it's not going to be very democratic. Forget about identity and regional pluralism. But secondly, if you're going to assure different groups of a stake in the system, um, particularly if they are at risk of losing out in the struggle for power at the center, you have to devolve power. You just have to, or they're going to defect from commitment to uh, and loyalty to the national political system. So I think federalism really uh, 
vigorous and meaningful federalism has been indispensable to India's democratic survival. I'm not, I would not equate Nigeria with India. It's been much less successful. It's much less of a democracy and so on. But the fact that Nigeria is even holding together now and you still have civilian rule 18 years, unbelievably, after the last transition, I think that is wholly unimaginable without Nigerian federalism. And I think Kenya would have blown up again in the last election if you hadn't had the... Uh, implementation of a quasi-federal system where you now have these roughly 50 county governments. The caveat that needs to be advanced, which I think will be also well appreciated in India, is when you devolve power down to lower levels, you know, what you're going to get in a lot of state governments and local governments may not be very pretty. It may involve a lot of corruption. It may involve abuse of minority rights at the state level. Uh, it may involve a weaker rule of law and pockets of um, illiberalism or even um, you know, what uh, Lentz and uh, Stepan called authoritarian enclaves. So you need federalism, but you also need uh, a federal center and a rule of law at the center that's strong enough to help people who are being abused within these lower units, you know, defend their rights and have a rule of law at the state and local level. Thank you, Larry. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, please identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Dr. Jyoti Kishatel. I'm uh, representing CLAWS. I'm a senior fellow with CLAWS. CLAWS is the... I'm... Uh, I'm Dr. Jyoti Patania. I'm from CLAWS. I'm a senior fellow there. Um, my question primarily to you is, um, what form of liberal democratic order do you categorize Pakistan as? Or you don't, you know, it, That's or, a short or, 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 it's, or, or it's an illiberal democratic order in itself. Uh, and secondly, in Pakistan, we talk about deep state. And I, I, uh, I presume there is some form of deep state existing in America, too. Would you qualify that, please? Thank you. Fantastic question. Uh, I'll come to you, Niranjan. Somebody there, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Marjan Joshi. I'm from the Amadmi Party. Um, so essentially, you're talking about autocracies versus democracies. And uh, so when you talk about public policy, public policy in the Indian context, in our history, has been very influenced by elections. So every five years, we have elections and all of our public policy is according to the populism that this country has generally had, whichever party it may be. And that affects our governance quite a bit. So in the kind of democracy that we have, we are led by policy that has subsidies, which has a bunch of incentives given to people. So how do we solve this problem of there being firstly a multiplicity of authority because there are different political parties at different platforms. B, all the political parties try to appeal and appease the population by populist policy. So if we were to be an autocracy or if we would have a set up like China for instance, there won't be those issues and problems that we face as a country here in India, where every five years the regime is changing or whichever regime that is coming into power is only appeasing the worker class. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I, I assume you have an answer to that second question. Um, and you don't need me to answer it for you, because otherwise, why would you be bothering with electoral politics in India, um, especially coming from a party that, um, you know, has uh, made a strong appeal for democratic reform? I think it is very important not to idealize the Chinese system. It's, th 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 there are very few things I have to say that um, I feel with stronger conviction than this. Um, first of all, don't assume that it isn't making a lot of mistakes 
and that China itself doesn't have a lot of corruption uh, and deep problems in the banking system and elsewhere that could come back to haunt it severely. Uh, I know some people who think it's a matter of great contention among people from the outside who study China's political economy, but I know some people who think that uh, a big, big crisis in the banking system is coming in China. So, so Larry, allow me to interrupt. I think his question is, isn't it easier to make a policy in, under an authoritarian regime versus I, I'm, I'm going, going, going through the tug, or, tug and twists of a democratic process? Um, well, but in a way, the answer that I'm coming to is, is responding to that. It's always easier to make policy in an authoritarian regime. Xi Jinping can just put his finger down, well, in a room probably the size of this one, and basically say, this is the policy. But um, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a good policy, or a right policy, or a sustainable policy, or that it um, is going to really represent the best interests of the people. That doesn't mean that democracies choose the best policies either. Um, but there's a difference between good, good and fair policy making on the one hand and rapid and decisive policy making on the other. Now that doesn't absolve us, those of us who consider ourselves as Democrats, those of us in the party system, those of us who advocate for democracy, from, from responsibility to advocate and arrive at good and responsible policies. And I'm not going to dispute the fundamental premise of your question, which is uh, evident in fresh ways in contemporary times, that there's a lot of bad, cheap, populist, and not only uh, policy that's not only disturbing in its implications for the rights of minorities, it's simply unsustainable. I'll just say this, we're piling up debt in the United States now at a rate that is going to lead to social and economic catastrophe in the tech decades to come if we don't do something about it. And um, both parties are equally uh, responsible because the Democrats want to spend as much as possible and the Republicans want to cut taxes as much as possible. And you know how they arrive at compromises that get budgets through? Each side gets what they want. The Republicans get low taxes, the Democrats get high spending, and the problem gets even worse. So um, I think that there are a couple answers here. One is that people like ourselves, who are not maybe immediately in the party system, but have access to public opinion and can shape it, need to you know, rise above our own partisan tendencies to call attention to these uh, longer term dangers and to what responsible policy looks like. And the second thing is sometimes you need to give politicians a way out. We got close, tantalizingly close in the United States to a solution to our budget problem um, by assembling an independent commission. It was called the Bowles Simpson Commission because it was co-chaired by Bill Clinton's chief of staff, Erskine Bowles, and the Republican Senator Alan Simpson. And it came up with a reasonable package of tax increases and spending cuts, including to entitlements, to get ahead of this problem before it becomes a disaster. But uh, the politicians, in the end, just couldn't support it, and it got trapped in uh, polarizing politics. Uh, now to your two questions. I can answer your first question really easily. Um, what type of uh, liberal democracy is Pakistan? It's very simple, neither. It's not liberal and it's not a democracy. Uh, it is illiberal, but it's not a democracy. Let me tell you why. It is not enough to simply hold competitive elections with significant uncertainty and with frequent changes in the leadership of government to say we have a democracy. Unless the people who are elected have real control of government, 
and real sovereignty to rule, then you're kind of dangerously down the road to Iran or Morocco or a number of other places where you might have, Iran is a little bit different because the elections are much more constrained. But in Morocco, there's, there's lots of competition. Elections are reasonably open and fair, but who's got the power? It's the monarchy. So who's got the power in Pakistan? You know, I'll never forget, it was one of the most telling moments I've ever had in my now four decades as a scholar of democracy, when uh, shortly after a lot of the democratic transitions in Latin America, I went down to the Carter Center that Jimmy Carter had established after he left the presidency. This is the mid-1980s. And he was hosting the president of Gua Guatemala, Vinicio Cerezo. Carl probably has met him. And um, Cerezo had just uh, recently been elected. I mean, Guatemala, just, just Google human rights violations and Guatemala is going to come up early and often. Uh, this was a brutalized um, military dictatorship. And Cerezo had won and, you know, was basically a liberal Democrat. And he said uh, that people were very kind of excited and he was a keynote speaker. And he said in his speech to us, I have about 10% of the power in this country. Um, you know who's got the rest? It's basically uh, the Guatemalan military and their business cronies. Ask Nawaz Sharif today uh, how much power he effectively had when he was prime minister. Forget about now that he's, and I'm not glorifying him. Look, the guy was, uh, from everything I've read, involved probably in serious corruption and so on. He was no angel. But the point is, no one who is elected in Pakistan today as the head of a civilian party is going to be running the country. It's the military and the inner services intelligence uh, and the whole deep state that is basically going to say, here are the no-goes, here's what you must do, here's what you cannot do, uh, keep your hands off our industries, and so on and so forth. And that is not a democracy. It doesn't matter how competitive elections are. There's a big difference between the deep state in Pakistan and the so-called deep state in um, a more genuine democracy. And the difference is the deep state in Pakistan is a corrupt, authoritarian, self-serving, perpetuating obstacle to real democratization and good governance in the country. And I would say to peace in South Asia. The deep state in, um, in the United States and in Europe, I'm not going to glorify it either or its occasional bureaucratic arrogance, but it's basically committed to democratic principles. And we are about to publish an article in the Journal of Democracy by two University of Chicago law professors that shows something very interesting. When democracy runs into trouble and when you've got efforts by illiberal Democrats with authoritarian instincts like Rajapaksa in uh, Sri Lanka and so on to try and uh, hijack power and turn it into an authoritarian regime. It's often the deep state that plays a very important role in trying to defend uh, democracy and eventually limit the damage, limit the tyranny and prepare the road for the, you know, either to, to preempt democratic, uh, uh, the, the, the permanent destruction of democracy or to preempt uh, even the, uh, the teardown of democracy in the first place. Any other questions? I'll just come to you. Yes, that's true. I'll just come to you. Niranjan. Um, uh, Niranjan Sahu, the senior fellow with ORF. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Diamond, for the very, very comprehensive overview. Uh, I have two questions. One is related to China. Uh, my question is, is uh, not China's threat is uh, really exaggerated to, to an extent that it's threat to liberal order. I see it's, it's now increasingly unraveling in a way that uh, it is actually going against China. If you look at the recent development in Australia, in New Zealand, there is a backlash uh, about Chinese interference. Uh, 
you have uh, a backlash also happening on BRI projects. Look at Malaysia, new government is actually reviewing. Even the government in Burma is reviewing some of the major projects with China. You have also problem in Pakistan. You have problem also uh, in Sri Lanka. You know, same project that you cited is also today has come under heavily democratic radar of the you know, country. Domestic politics is boiling, really. So I'm saying China, the way China was moving in last seven, eight years, it's not really going to uh, have a sort of uh, unchallenged kind of thing. It's facing resistance, and it would actually uh, get entangled in those countries' domestic politics. So I'm saying uh, we we have to be careful about our assessment about China's uh, sort of threat to liberal a lot. Of. Rather, my second question is we have to actually uh, which you have brought out in many uh, slides uh, about the internal crisis of uh, democratic countries, which is actually fastening this entire uh, <clears throat> problem that we see. Uh, uh, one problem which I actually see uh, to a large extent is, uh, which you also mentioned, about the, the breakdown of uh, that organic uh, relation between capitalism and democracy, which was there for several you know, centuries. And, and in a sense, uh, this actually appealed to a lot of countries that, you know, with economic reforms, globalization, and, you know, <clears throat> all, all this, you know, uh, good governance, uh, things will be better and inclusive uh, uh, ideas can be promoted. That is now facing the real trouble with economic stagnation, uh, falling down of wages, real wages, middle class, which is to be the strongest votary of democracy, uh, rule-based order is now is actually less inclined to support. And that's where the real problem is. And this is also fastening, this process is now fastening because of automation. The jobs are disappearing and uh, <clears throat> you have, uh, which is actually creating space for uh, the populist, uh, the demagogue and, you know, illiberal uh, politicians to capture the space and, you know, run the thing the way they understand. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Niranjan. Uh, there's a lady there. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, we are past the time. So I'm going, to, I'm going to get into extra time right now, like in football, uh, FIFA football. We're going to have about five to seven minutes. So make your questions brief and your answers too. Um, I have, uh, my name is Surabhi. I'm a research fellow at Indian Council of World Affairs. I have a very short question. So you mentioned immigration, rising immigration as a cause of democratic uh, crisis world over. But uh, taking the case of Europe, if you look at the numbers, the numbers today are at the lowest in the past four years. Yet we see increasing polarization. The spending by the European Union has come down uh, uh, as compared to the peak of 2015. But if you see increasing polarization in Europe in the narrative that is being portrayed by the politicians all across uh, of the fear of rising numbers. So your take on that, it, isn't it just a manipulation rather than the actual fear of rising numbers? Thank you. Sir, over there. Uh, I'm a retired professor of JNU. I'll be asking a question. I don't know whether I should ask you or not. But as you are aware, uh, the world is moving towards greater inequality. And this has not been checked and seems very unlikely to be checked in the future as things are moving. There and was the another, crux sorry. of that is the distribution of knowledge, uh, which will be the driving force in the years to come. Now, in this context, I would like to ask you your opinion, whether you have considered it. Would you prefer a liberal intellectual property rights or a stronger one uh, for, for the best of the humanity? Uh, just a small question. Thank you. Somebody over here uh, had raised a hand. So last two questions there. Taking them all together. Maybe you could club some. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Zafar. I'm a PhD student. Uh, my question is, you talk about uh, parameters of uh, democracy and why it's declining. So uh, what's your opinion about current political uh, situation in India? Uh, how you judge through your parameters now? Thank you. Uh, I'm Dinakar. I'm a journalist with The Hindu. Uh, just uh, probably a uh, uh, taking partly the question he yeah, just asked, uh, there is a rise of uh, strong leaders in traditional democracies. So, and there are still democracies, but there is an extreme rise. I mean, there are whole examples, in, probably including India, on US, and many more in between. And technology is aiding them, I mean, more so social media. I mean, social media ex is being uh, employed, exploited, both it, it gives a seeming impression that it's the, it, the, the leaders are reaching out to the public, which probably is not the case. But it gives that imp uh, impression. Uh, 
Cambridge Analytica is one such case how it has been successfully used, and there are many more. So your views on that? How do you classify them? So sorry, what Thank is you. the question? The rise of the rise of strongmen strong reaching, men reaching out to people democracies. directly is actually a mirage, which is being manipulated by Cambridge Analytica. With social the types, media playing a big role in that. Playing. Uh, well, I don't think the rise of strongmen is just a mirage. It's certainly being facilitated by social media. Uh, but there is a tendency around the world. Um, it is resurgent. You know, ideology is not very strong right now. It's really identity that's available to be mobilized. It is ironic that with the depth of economic problems and challenges we have, which I'm going to come back to in conclusion, that it's identity that these populists tend to mobilize more. Uh, but when people, if you look back to the work of our great late colleague and founding member of the Journal of Democracy editorial board, uh, who we've named an annual lecture series for, Seymour Martin Lipset. Um, you, uh, you find, you know, in Lipset's writing that um, it's when people are challenged in the ways that you were describing, uh, uh, Neuron John, uh, that they become susceptible to these identity appeals. So it's unfortunately not a mirage. It's very uh, real. Uh, my comment on the Indian political situation is that you're going to have a very important national election next year. And it seems like people are already starting to think about it and mobilize around it. And I don't like making comments about a country, a democratic country's politics when it's heading into uh, an electoral uh, season. I'll just say that, um, you know, the vibrancy and integrity of uh, democracy in India are really, really important to the future of democracy in the world. All you have to do is go back to that chart I showed you before uh, to see that. And yes, OK, China is more powerful. It's got a much bigger military. It's got a much bigger economy. It's seen as more successful. But you know, the Indian model now, with your success in high technology, and you're beginning to have foreign investment and also God, Indian culture is so popular in the United States now uh, in a variety of ways, film, food, art, so on. Uh, don't underestimate your potential to you know, uh, shape thinking in the world. In terms of liberal intellectual property rights, well, I mean, I believe in intellectual property rights. I, I think they're very important to be protected. But in the world of uh, writing and ideas, I think we could move toward more common access. Uh, I can tell you my next project is to write a textbook on democratic development. I'm going to try and um, uh, develop a lot of these ideas. And I've started teaching. I'm going to revive uh, an open access, um, uh, massive open online course on democracy. It's for free. I'm going to make the next book I'm writing for free on the internet in multiple languages. So I think we could do it, especially for something as important as democratic knowledge and ideas. We should do more to uh, you know, transcend the limits of uh, intellectual property rights, if that's what you were asking about. Uh, to Sorupi, uh, where are you? Oh, yes. Um, so uh, yes, it's true, but you know, two things are true. Number one, in Europe, immigration has subsided a bit, particularly the absorption of refugees. But number two, countries like Germany, France, uh, Britain, uh, a couple more like Sweden and Netherlands, do have a higher percentage of foreign born than they've ever had. And the foreign-born encompass more social and religious diversity than they've ever experienced before. I think it's a wonderful thing. I think that's what makes America such a great country, is that we are such a, a gathering ground and uh, you know, uh, soil for uh, 
uh, such extraordinary uh, diversity around uh, you know, common values. But these countries, it's going to take a while for them to absorb it. And so, I mean, this is a major point of our colleague Frank Fukuyama's book on identity, which is about to come out. Sometimes societies just need some breathing room if liberal values are going to kind of find new footing and, um, and triumph. So now, finally, to your two questions. Um, yes, I think maybe we're at a moment now of pushback against China's sharp power. Uh, but I'll say a few things. Number one, this would not be happening at all today without people ringing the bell, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, to expose what's been happening. And number two, the extent of China's uh, penetration of a lot of different sectors and institutions through uh, the work of its United Front Work Department and uh, the pressure on overseas Chinese media, overseas Chinese communities, and so on, it's going on beneath the surface, not well documented, often not well understood, in very, very uh, you know, profound and disturbing ways. Uh, when you no longer have Chinese language media in Australia that reflect anything but the Chinese Communist Party line, because they basically bought it all up, what does that say about democracy? And just as one could be concerned about hysteria, and also something that I know a lot of my colleagues who are uh, maybe China specialists and are looking at this in the context of the United States and in other countries as well, are worried about feeding even ethnocentric or possibly racist stereotypes that you know all people of Chinese descent are somehow ultimately loyal to the Beijing communist authorities and not to their own societies and governments. That's a huge danger we need to be alert to. But there's also a danger of dismissing or ignoring this. And um, I, I'm going to leave you, I'll answer your last question in a minute, but I'm going to leave you uh, with something that I think everybody in this room ought to be deeply, deeply worried about. China, and I can give you the source if you want to see it. Uh, it's now open record. Uh, China has been, for 20 years now, stealing, hacking into, forcing the transfer of through internal corporate means, and otherwise acquiring uh, some of the most powerful cutting edge technologies of the future. Drone technology, robotics, artificial intelligence, biotech, down the line. This is um, uh, hydrosonics being incorporated into their military in ways that uh, if the technology uh, theft and transfer is not addressed, will give China, in, in a period of time that is visible on the horizon, eight years, 12 years, 15 years, I mean, I don't know many people who think it's more than 20 years, and I know many who think it's less, military superiority in at least the Asia Pacific region. Or at least uncertainty as to who would win a war if, God forbid, it comes to that between China and the United States. Now, I'd just like you to ask yourself this question. What's the world going to look like uh, if China has military superiority in Asia. You think it's just going to be a benign power that's going to say, when someone says, we don't want your belt and road, well, OK, we'll just walk away. My final uh, response is to your question about the tension between capitalism and democracy in this day and age. There was a great piece in the New York Times by Michael Tomosky. I don't know, last week, 10 days, the editor of not the Journal of Democracy, but Democracy, a Journal of Ideas, in which he basically said, look, capitalists, if you're worried about the rise of uh, socialist um, uh, 
advocacy and candidates in the Democratic Party and elsewhere in the United States and in the West, uh, look at yourselves uh, and the capitalism that you are generating all over again, where we've got historic concentrations of wealth. You know, all you have to do is look at one slide, one figure. The um, trends in real wages of working and middle class people between 1970 and today basically go like this. They kind of start improving a little bit. Obviously, they declined in the 2008 financial crisis, came back. But they've basically been flat for 40 years, slightly improving. The real incomes of the top 1% uh, of the American public in particular, but also the top 10%. And then the top 1 tenth of 1%, they go like this. That's just unsustainable. It's unsustainable. And it's, you know, the near-term manifestation may be great for uh, the rich corporations in the United States. And the near-term manifestation has been, uh, you know, a successful deflection of this economic and social anger and, to distri and distress onto minorities uh, and immigrants and fake uh, sources of the real problem. But the longer term thing is going to be a much more, I think, fundamental threat to the capitalist order. Um, so your closing remarks, um, could you put them around what does the future of democracy look like? Will it evolve or are we looking at a new system that will replace democracy? And we have no time, so maybe one minute. Well, uh, you know, we could take a week, a day, an hour, or a minute. So the one-minute version is that I think that the basic structures of liberal democracy, competitive elections, constitutional courts, civil society, rule of law will survive, but that we new me need new means of dialogue and inclusion. And the social media age has offered some elements of inclusion and dialogue that are very worrisome and very polarizing. But you know, if you're looking for institutional innovations, I think we've got some that we're working on at Stanford at our Center on Deliberative Democracy that are using moderation, uh, moderated deliberative polls of randomly selected individuals moderated online dialogues, lots of different tools that can give people voice in a civil way and provide new channels for the articulation of public sentiment. So I think the institutions of democracy are not going to uh, be radically reinvented, but if they don't grow and evolve with the times and the technological possibilities, that will be a problem also. Thank you, Larry. So the first part of your talk was uh, bringing a, uh, partic particularly the dark colors that you used on your slide were bringing some sort of a gloom into the room that you know, there was a whole lot of, we are losing democracy and it's getting pessimistic. But I see that, uh, in fact, there is an optimist hiding behind there, yeah, of course. Uh, seeking reform, seeking change. And, uh, and this uh, may be a free, it may not be a free fall, maybe it's a blip. And that's the best we can hope for. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Larry, for coming here.